when you have an opportunity to uh, work on something that not many people uh, get a chance to see or something that has been uh, disappearing over time and you have a chance to really uh, work to solve that problem, uh, that, that really is, is something very exciting. And my name is Eric Hilton. I'm a professor of marine science and curator of fishes at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science at William and Mary in um, Gloucester Point, Virginia. And I've been working on sturgeon as well for several decades. Um, and uh, But I came to it from a, a slightly different bent. I'm trained as a comparative anatomist. Um, and a part-time paleontologist, and slowly over my career have incorporated aspects of uh, ecology into my work. And, and I try and piece these three worlds together to, to understand life on Earth. And sturgeons are a great example of that because when I started working on them, I started with the anatomy of a living species. And then I got to dissect a 78 million year old sturgeon. And then I got to handle a live sturgeon in the water and see where it goes. And trying to understand the variation within the species, within the group of fishes generally between species, I think is a really important aspect of both evolutionary biology and putting that evolutionary biology into a context of um, where we, what we've done to the planet and where we can take the planet. My name is Maria Angeles Arce and I'm the executive director for the Center for Systematic Biology and Evolution here at the Academy. And the Center for Systematic Evolution uh, is, is, the, is the, the one that groups all the collections that we have here at the Academy. We host about 20 million specimens from a lot of different groups. And one of those is uh, ichthyology, the fish department where I was previously part of uh, as well. I've been doing research with the Academy in Fish for about 20 years now. And um, I am not a specialist in sturgeon. I work with a lot of different fish. I am passionate about catfish, but I am, uh, yeah, that's, that's a weird passion. Like nobody understands it. I find them very, very attractive, but nobody else does. They, they have uh, barbels too. They have barbels too. And, uh, but a lot of the, the conversation that we're going to have today, I think applies uh, not only to sturgeon, but a lot of different species that and 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 seeing yeah. how the environments are being altered and what can we do about uh, what's happening out there? Yeah, first time I've heard somebody describe catfish as attractive, but <laughs> I'll learn. I'll learn to appreciate them. Dwayne, let's start. Let's start with you. Did you say sturgeon were uncharismatic? Because I, I mean, look at this. This is pretty charismatic. <laughs> Give us some of the stats that make these fish so, that make sturgeon so amazing. So you, you have to realize that I'm sitting up here coming from things at a different angle and I have the world expert right over here. This guy with the beard longer than mine. Uh, so I'm a little hesitant to do that. But so this Atlantic sturgeon, which is the species that's up here in Historically, this species got to be 14 feet long and, you know, a thousand pounds. And here in the Delaware, so I, I, I live in Lewis, Delaware, but I, I work up and down the Delaware River. We have tagged animals that, that regularly transit this part of the river in excess of 350 pounds. So this is the source of caviar. That's, you know, these sturgeons are the source of caviar. And, and between the period of 1890 to 1905, the Delaware River led the world in caviar production. So we, we harvested caviar, and this was before we had motors. Like it, was, it was oars and sails and cotton nets and no depth finders, no anything else. And they were able to harvest inordinate amount of sturgeon. And so it's, it's just a... It's a great, it's a great fish. They're really, when you get your chance to hold your hands on them, they're, they're truly amazing species. And Eric, what happened to the sturgeon in a nutshell? They were so abundant at one point, and then what happened other than caviar? Um, well, I think caviar is the, a big, a big part of that story. Um, yeah. So I, I always like to make the quip that 
they have a bad combination of being big and tasty. Um, and that's not a, a great combination um, if you don't want to be eaten. And so I think that that, that was the, you know, we, we harvested, over harvested those, those fishes and, and we being up and down the coast, <laughs> you know, we, we um, but the other factors that come into play are, are the life history of these, these fishes. They're, they're long lived. They, they don't mature until, you know, well into their teens. So, and they live to 60 years, 60 years or so. And you say, okay, well, that's, that's still 50 years of, of reproductive life. But as, as Dwayne has shown and others studying the ecology of these fishes, they don't return every year. It takes a lot of effort to, and energy stores to, to go swim along the coast up to Canada and back. You know, I can barely walk up this flight of stairs. So, um, but they, they come down, they spawn, it might not be another five years until they, they, they spawn again. So when you start doing the calculations, they don't reproduce all that much. And you can, and 99% of them will be eaten. Yeah. So you start taking out of that population, any of the reproductive animals, they will, it, it doesn't last long. Now we've, I'll get to everybody in a moment, but Dwayne, your research has come up several times now already. So talk a little bit about what you studied and what you found and how you did that work too. So um, I come, Eric and I come at things differently. Um, and we've known each other for a long time, but um, I, I, I was a, a product of a wildlife fisheries and wildlife program. And I, I, I grew up working on fishing boats and so being around wildlife people, they come at things a lot differently than most fishery scientists do. And um, so one of the things that we were really interested in, the, the largest single source of mortality for these Atlantic sturgeon and the Delaware River that we know of is vessel strikes. So the Delaware River right out here is, you know, it's the world's largest freshwater port. 75% of all the oil that's refined on the East Coast is here in the Delaware. It, you know, it, it's, it's the center of our, of our region's economy, so it's really important. But what the Army Corps of Engineers has done, you know, historically the Delaware River was 18 feet deep before we started. And for the last 130 years, we've dredged it lower and lower. And so we've channelized the river and we put these large draft vessels in close proximity to these sturgeon and so sturgeon get killed by the propellers it's a it's it's a problem so they come back to spawn and and the area around marcus hook chester you know a little bit south of here to tinicum island the philadelphia airport that's probably the primary spawning reach and that's right in the middle of where the shipping industry is and so we we know that there are sturgeon washing up on the beach that are dead and so one way as scientists that we can understand how many of those sturgeons are really out there is to get a reporting rate. So the way to do that and what they do in wildlife is you take carcasses, you know, if you're interested in how many tortoises get killed, you place tortoises around and see who reports them. And so uh, my colleagues and I <laughs> spent a couple of years, well, we spent about five years stockpiling sturgeon, uh, dead sturgeon, and then we spent two years placing them around the Delaware estuary, surreptitiously placing them around the Delaware estuary. The dead sturgeon. Yeah, yeah. How do you place a dead sturgeon into We never got arrested. <laughs> Say we never got arrested, but, but there's, uh, and so we, we generated through a statistical approach, we came up with a stratified random design and, and we selected sites that we were going to place sturgeon on and again, in a ran stratified random design. And so we went out at set times during periods, weekly periods with X number of sturgeon and we placed sturgeon at locations to see if they were going to get reported. So I, I have explored every nook and cranny of the Delaware estuary. And at the end of all of this, what we found was that of the sturgeon that we placed there, about 4.7% were actually reported. And, um, and so that's just in keeping in mind, so we only know that 
for every 20 sturgeon that's on the beach, only one gets reported, 5%. And that's just the sturgeon that end up on the beach. So it's, 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 an, it's, a, it's a problem. I don't know how we go about solving it, but that's what I'm hoping we can hear from people today. Because we have to have commerce, but I would I would argue we should also give these things a chance too. Yeah, and I want to encourage everybody who has a question, write it down on the cards, and then just hold up the card, and somebody will collect it and get it to us. What's up? Yes. All right. Yeah, you can start bringing them up at any time as long as I can read them. So let's talk a little bit about, and I don't know who wants to take this question, but. What do we know about sturgeon populations at this point in time? How dire is the situation at this moment? You can start and then we can pass it Yeah, so, so historically, 1890s, our estimates, there's published reports at the estimates of the, the, the number of mature Atlantic sturgeon, this species, was 360,000 individuals in the Delaware River. And so a couple of years ago, some colleagues and I published a paper and our best estimate today but through 2021 was that we have a run size. That's the total number of animals that are returning to spawn in the Delaware River. That's on average over a five year period around 200 individuals. Say that number again. 200. So that's less than one one hundredth of a percent of the original population. This species was listed as endangered in 2012. David, did you want to weigh in on that too? Uh, actually, no, I don't have anything okay. really to add. I was wondering if there, you but, could talk a little but, bit about um, how the fate of the sturgeon sort of mirrors some of the other species that may not be quite as big and iconic. Well, but it's funny you use that language, mirror and not as big, because when he said 14 foot long, I'm thinking, well, what's the fish we're working with now? It's an iron color shiner that's like four centimeters long. Okay. <laughs> um, and so that's where that's where a lot of my work deals with a lot of non-game species. So these are uh, typically what people would uh, dismiss as just minnows or, you know, a schooling, schooling fish uh, in a small stream. But uh a lot of the work that I do is with uh, these small diminutive minnows, uh, iron color shiner or bridal shiner. Um, and their story is, there's similarities. Uh, some of the things that, that Dwayne mentioned uh, that were problems for sturgeon in terms of channelization, we see that with other fishes. So when you have a very shallow Delaware river or Delaware estuary where the iron color shiner was once very prolific, it was found pretty commonly. Um, it likes weedy, vegetated, shallow water habitat. And so when you uh, fill in these areas, as we did when we settled the area, we started to fill in the swamps, fill, fill in the wetlands, uh, channelize and deepen, deepen the river to allow for commerce and whatnot. Uh, that, that resulted in a lot of habitat loss. And so for uh, Iron Color Shiner, one of the factors has been habitat loss. Uh, it, they share that with, um, with sturgeon. Uh, other factors, though, that might be a little more unique uh, to iron color and some other non-game fishes would be uh, things like land use change that has resulted in uh, taking a landscape that might be forested, removing the vegetation, turning that into a farm. Then you have the runoff from that farm, which creates very turbid conditions, turbid waters. Uh, a fish like the iron color shiner is a sight feeder. So it can't see the, can't see anymore, so it can't feed. So that's just one factor. Um, so removing vegetation, channelization, habitat changes on the landscape or land use changes on the landscape are all things that affect um, other non-game fishes or other fishes that are kind of imperiled. And how do you get a sense of populations with these very small fish? I mean, I could see there being challenges chasing down sturgeon and such, but at least they're big. So what if you're looking for these little guys and there are so few left? Uh, you, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting because it it's almost the exact opposite. Uh, again, we have a very small fish, but this particular fish that we're working with now is uh, a very social kind of guy. Uh, what they call a gregarious minnow, likes to hang out in very large schools. So when you do find iron color shiner, which for example, in the state of New Jersey only occur in two watersheds in the entire state, 
Um, you find it in very large schools. Uh, so where it does occur, it, it thrives. And then that creates the challenge of counting all of those little guys uh, when you collect them. So you can find them in schools of, uh, we were up in a location in New York and um, we were surveying them by a dip net. We're on the front of a boat and you're taking a big net and you're scooping the fish out of the water and you look in your net and you have a hundred of these little tiny minnows mixed in with other species of fish and you got to be quick you don't want to hold them for too long if you look at them the right way they might they might die so you want to get them back in the water and uh it's really a challenge so what we do is uh, we find ways to count them uh there's other techniques uh you know that could be used uh like mark recapture and whatnot but it's it's tough when you have so many so many small fish so and I and I just want to say that <clears throat> part of the uh, the work that uh, David does uh, kind of um, we kind of complement each other with the work that we do in the collections. That's like we have been uh, uh, getting the snapshots of the natural world for more than two hundred years now. That means that our uh, specimens in the collection we have things that are like you were seeing the sturgeon out there is like a, a pre eighteen ninety eight. So we have things that are like from a long time ago. And what we do, and the, the reason why we collect and have these repositories in the academy is like to help us understand <coughs> the changes in the composition of the ecosystem through time. So we can look at a certain area 100 years ago and see what species we found and we collect at that point. It's not an exact measurement of the populations in the sense that what David is, is doing because that's at like real time and, and, and we're, not gonna, we're not collecting everything that we find. That wouldn't be um, um, fair, but it's basically giving us a snapshot of what was there and what is not maybe at this point. And I'm sure a lot of what is not. Yes. Yeah. yeah you, mm -hmm. you see a lot of changes and, and all of those changes will be kind of like a reflection of the changes in the environment and, and that's that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And, and I wanted to add and, and kind of add on to both of those, those thoughts. Um, the, so I run uh, several monitoring programs for shad and river herring in Virginia. Um, so we're looking at the relative abundance of spawning of, of these species that, that are important forage fishes for um, larger fishes in the, in the river. Um, but that, that, those populations, they're, they're going down. We can show that trend over time. Um, looking for that, the, the reason, I would add one thing on to what David said, um, or, or emphasize one thing. It's not the, the popu the, it's not the environment that we, were, we had in 1890, you know, when the, at the height of the fishing. Um, lots of things have changed. In addition to those that David mentioned, Climate change has has undergone, and there, there's been a really dramatic increase in temperature, increase in just environment of the the bay. Um, and, well, I'm speaking of the, the Chesapeake Bay, but the Delaware Bay, same. You know, there's you know the the time when the those large 14 foot sturgeons were being caught along the coast. You could be on the a boat and see the bottom of the, the rivers. You could see the bottom of the, the bay. You can't do that now. Um, and so that that impacts the, the siltation, the, the environmental changes, the industrialization, um, you know, the, the use of water, impact, you know, use taking the surface water out of the river. Um, all of these things impact. The, the populations of not just sturgeon, not just an adrenous fish, but the, the little guys. Um, and adding on to the, you know, it, these collections are important. And from all of these time periods in that what we can do with that preserved specimen now, people, you know, even 10 years ago wouldn't have uh, thought that we could analyze those specimens the way we do. Um, and when I arrived at VIMS just about 20 years ago, people hadn't been collecting striped bass or some of these common fishes that you know, are really important for the economy, for people's livelihoods, for, but they haven't, 
preserved that snapshot. Um, a few years later, colleagues were asking if they could get historical specimens or samples, muscle samples from historical specimens 80, 90 years ago to look at stable isotope ratios. So these chemical signatures preserved in the muscle tissue of animals that get preserved along with the, the specimen. And you can look at kind of changes in, in feeding, uh, where they are feeding on the food web, you know, through an analysis of that. So these collections are vital. And, you know, much like a library that stops buying books, <laughs> you know, if you stop collecting even that snapshot, you're, you're instantly limiting the factor or the impact that that collection can have. All right. So, I think you so can tell that our audience is very passionate yeah. about sturgeon, and, and right? I, <laughs> we'll get to I, these. Can I just chime in one thing? So yes. we've, we've heard a lot about habitat changes. And I think when you look back historically at the Delaware River, right? And it's the river system that I've worked on now for 23, 24 years. When you look and you look at the records um, of the system and, and you look, you know, this is where the Industrial Revolution really happened, right? And you look... With the textile industry and the shipping industry on the Delaware, back 100 years ago, the river would be, and there's records, documented records of this, the river would be red on Monday because the dyes in the river, and the river would be green on Tuesday and blue, and then purple on th Thursday with the textile industry. And so effectively what happened to, to our river for about a 50, 60 year period is that we there was a block in the river that went all the way down to about where the nuclear power plant is, an oxygen block. And so the water quality has changed and it's actually gotten a lot better. Is it perfect? No, but there's signs of hope. The river is, it is still turbid, it's still dark, but it's not changing colors on a daily basis. So, yeah. so I'm, a, I'm an optimist and I'm trying to look at things positively. Yeah, and that's a lot of um, questions that we've gotten so far. I'm just trying, I'm just going to try to group them together a little bit so we can get to all of them. But we did get several questions about the role of pollution. And I guess that would pertain to all of the fish we're talking about, not just the sturgeon. So there was a question about the power plant, the nuclear power plant, and, and other factors in terms of pollution that is especially detrimental to, to the fish. David, do you want to start with the, the little guys and then we'll go to the big guys? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Dwayne just touched on a, a few things. The yeah. you know you you have uh, industri industrialization, chemical pollution, uh, pollution from wastewater has been a major issue in the region. Uh, sediment is often I think forgotten by a lot of folks, but sediment is probably the number one pollutant that I encounter. Um, once you get past the uh, and when you say sediment, what do you mean by that? Uh, sediment siltation. Um, turbidity in the water, um, they tend to uh, destroy habitat. If you would think, picture in your minds, uh, we'll leave the Delaware estuary for a brief moment. If you picture in your mind a babbling brook, uh, and then you take that babbling brook, if, you, if you're in the babbling brook, you have all these crevices, rocks, coarseness. That is what those particular fishes like. That's what they want uh, where you're, when you're on that part of the landscape. When you, you know, uh, deforest and maybe put in a, uh, some agriculture upstream and you start to increase the siltation and sedimentation going into the stream, one of the things that that does is it destroys the habitat by filling in those crevices, filling in those, those interstitial spaces that those fish rely on. And it changes a lot of other things as well. So a lot of your streams are polluted or impaired, uh, to use the regulatory language, uh, due to sediment. Um, but that is, that's one issue, the, uh, obviously the wastewater and the dissolved oxygen pollution block that Dwayne was talking about. Um, you know, that, that was a major issue for yeah. sturgeon and rip migratory fish like shad and river herring in the Delaware. Um, I would say, you know, sturgeon have such a long uh, generation time, which maybe Eric and Dwayne can talk about. And some of the other fishes though, um, something like an iron color shiner, they only live to be about two, two and a half. You know, so they're, they're pretty quick in terms of their, their generation time. And that's just one factor in, in kind of trying to understand this. Mm -hmm. Any other big factors in terms of pollution that affect the life cycles of these species? Or do we cover it all? 
No, so I, I think uh, I, th I think a couple of things. So Dave pointed out uh, the issue with siltation, and that's you know one of the things. So for sturgeon, they require so sturgeon. That's a source of caviar, right? And where you find sturgeon require fresh water to spawn, no salt. So, but they also require rocks. And so when a sturgeon egg is fertilized, that sturgeon egg becomes very, very sticky. And they adhere to the first thing that they're going to stick to. And so the eggs are negatively buoyant. So the female sturgeon gets down close to the bottom and then fertilization takes place. And they stick to the first thing that comes in contact with you. And so if you're, if you're trying to collect eggs, imagine a needle in a haystack. And if you're trying to collect them, you will oftentimes find, if you're close, you'll start finding them on ropes and other things, right? They, they stick to everything. But the problem is, is if they stick to something and then silt comes over the top of it, as that egg starts to develop, that, that you know, it undergoes the process of cellular division. And all of a sudden, it can't diffuse enough oxygen across the barrier because of silt. And so, so that's it's getting buried. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's effectively, and it, and it suffocates and that's what happens. Or so if those eggs end up in a spot and there's not clean, hard bottom, they roll around and those eggs become blocked up and they don't hatch. And so that's, that's one of the big issues that we have. Yeah. And that is a repeating theme through particularly with the, the anadromous fishes that um, spawn in just above the, the salt wedge or, or in that tidal freshwater area, if that bottom is not there, um, it, they can't reproduce. And that's one of the things that we've seen with shad. Um, some of the prime spawning grounds in some of the rivers in Virginia are silted over to the point that it's mud. And the eggs, you know, no matter how, much, how many fish come back, the, the population is going to suffer. We also had a question. Sorry, do you want to weigh in on that? I was just going to say that there is other things that we still don't know fully how affect the like microplastics, whatever chemicals, those things. We know they are there. We find them in the specimens, but there's still no. There's there's much more work to be done to understand what is the effect of all of this uh, in, in the development. We also had a question about invasive species and what kind of threats they pose uh, flathead and blue catfish were two that were named here. You All guys right, have so blue catfish? <laughs> yeah, we do now. Thanks, Eric. So, yeah, tell us what they are about and who they pose a threat to. We, we were just chatting about this, but, I, well, Dwayne's not picking up his mic, but, no. um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I have some thoughts on that, you know, uh, that's in, in terms of the iron color, iron color shiner space. Um, you know, there, and it also actually goes along with, with shad and river herring as well. Uh, maybe one of these guys can talk about how flatheads and uh, blue cats interact with, uh, potentially with uh, sturgeon. But, um, you know, one of the things that we do for American shad and river herring to help, one of the things that we can do in the freshwater portion of their, uh, when they're in the freshwater portion for their life cycle, <laughs> is uh, increase spawning habitat. And so that takes you to uh, passing dams and dam removal. And when you do that, you increase spawning habitat, in theory, for shad and river herring. Uh, that's a good thing. But also when you do that, you're increasing connectivity uh, for invasive species that may be downstream. And so that's just another factor that has to be considered. And it has to be considered when you have potentially endangered species upstream, and that may be their only stronghold. Those, in, those endangered species may only be in a few choice locations in the basin. And although we want to increase habitat for shad and herring, you have to weigh that, uh, weigh that factor. You know, uh, maybe that's not the best place to remove the dam. So in terms of connectivity, uh, definitely there's an invasive species issue there to consider. So you have to be careful that you create habitat, but not invite all kinds of new threats. Yeah, the dam removal is really big right now. Folks want to uh, remove dams, increase connectivity. There's lots of positives. But when you have only, in the case of Iron Color Shiner, you only have them in two watersheds in the entire state of New Jersey, um, it gives you a little pause and you definitely have to think, is this the best decision right now for this species, for this particular area? So as a catfish lover, what's your take on the, <laughs> on the blue catfish? Right. 
Yeah, the problem there is that, uh, I mean, like any invasive species, they are uh, getting to an environment that where they basically take over. And by the time that we see them and they, uh, uh, they are, it's already too late. There's no, we, there has been a lot of work into trying to, to uh, detect the species before they reproduce highly. And that there is a, uh, some work with eDNA, which is basically you take a sample of water and you run some molecular tests to see what species are in this water, just to try to understand before you, you get the specimens. When you're already seeing them, they are taking over because there is no competition, uh, like fair competition with the, with the local ones. Sometimes, sometimes, very few times, it could be a little fair game there, but it's usually they're just like taking over everything. As, like, and as, as David was saying, like if you are opening spaces for reproduction of, of, of the uh, danger ones, then you're inviting the invasive species coming there as well. Yeah. Now we got a lot of questions about what to do. So I think we should talk a little bit about solutions. And we got several questions like, how do I help protect the fish? Great question, right? So a lot of people wanted to know about potentially, is it, would it be possible to, um, to create, for example, artificial reefs that have been used to, to create additional spawning sites for some species? The results are mixed, but it is possible to design, is it possible to design artificial spawning sites that are specifically set up for sturgeon? Anybody want to take that? No, no. Well, I'll, I'll take it from uh, uh, secondhand observations of, of in just that uh, um, measure that was taken in uh, Virginia. Um, to try and help the James River population of sturgeon um, establishing a, an artificial reef um, as spawning ground. And it, it did not succeed you know, because of the, the issues of, you know, that it's, it's not even putting a Band-Aid on it because the Band-Aid, it's like putting a Band-Aid on, but then putting your thumb back into like, you know, Awful bacterial, <laughs> you know the the the, the um, you know siltation issue is still there. So within a year, that reef was was not functional. Yeah. So it, it's a great question, a great idea, and it's actually Eric pointed out the James River example. It's in the Detroit River with Lake Sturgeon. It's been used successfully. So they have up there. They uh, they've been able to to do that and to, to provide artificial spawning substrate in that system, which was heavily impacted by dredging and they were able to do that. Um, the issue here, right? So, so the issue here, right now we have a couple of hundred sturgeon, full stop. Okay, that's, that's where we are. And there, so, so for spawning, additional spawning habitat to work, it's, it's not, I'm of the theory, there's a lot of hard bottom, clean hard bottom that's out there. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm a pragmatist. The Army Corps of Engineers spent $600 million to deepen the river. And for us to then go in and say, we wanna put rock back in these locations, it's gonna be a really heavy lift, no pun intended, to put that rock back in. And not to only put it in a place we've gotta get sturgeon to go there, but we also have to be concerned about navigation. And right now, I don't think we have enough sturgeon that, that 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 habitat is an issue. We just, there's too many sources of mortality in the system. Yeah. So another question here, by the way, with a great picture on the back of a sturgeon is, is it, is it unethical to raise Atlantic sturgeon? I guess to raise them in captivity is the question, to raise them somewhere else and then release them? Is that even possible? I don't think it's unethical. Um, the, 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 so the, um, I think that there is a, a hatchery or an aquaculture facility used doing Atlantic sturgeon and, and yeah. Um, and I've worked with, um, for a variety of projects, worked with uh, hatcheries all over the world, in fact. Um, groups in China raising Chinese species of sturgeon for caviar production 
um, some uh, colleagues in Europe um, and also on the West Coast here. Um, not so much for um, reintroduction per se, but to better understand and, and for an aquaculture. I mean, there are aquaculture facilities. It, it just takes a long time to get that to a return on that investment. So the farms that I've worked with in California, so part of my research is looking at, at how um, sturgeons develop, how, how their skeleton develops, how their, their muscles develop, when they develop, and, and what they're doing at different points in their life history. And you know, the, the needle in the haystack is, is an apropos uh, uh, analogy because you can't collect material out in the wild um, you know, to get a reliable developmental series for one species, let alone doing something comparative and you know, working with all of the North American species. Um, these aquaculture facilities, I've collected developmental series of all of these species, and now we have a better understanding of the comparisons between those individual species um, through that type of work. But that's a byproduct of their businesses, these, these farms produce caviar, they produce meat, um, and, and that's, that's their livelihood. And that, that it's, um, it takes the pressure off, their, hopefully it takes the pressure off those, those wild stocks, you know, any potential poaching, any potential, I mean, that's another aspect of mortality that, that hasn't been brought up, but there is poaching that goes on, people harvesting illegally. Uh, yeah. um, sturgeons and other fishes that are protected, so. And I think to the specific question in terms of like raising them to release them, I think it would, I mean, I don't think it's unethical either, but I also think that there's no con conditions in the natural habitat that are gonna guarantee the survival of these species after they get released. So that's the problem. That's why they are kept under this aquaculture and like the products are being sold directly from there because there is no guarantee that these are gonna survive. Yeah, uh, just more broadly, uh, uh, you know, whenever you're, so a lot of times in, uh, endangered species might be um, raised in captivity uh, or aquaculture facilities for reintroduction purposes. And, you know, the one thing I think that's uh, a major concern there is just making sure that you have uh, when genetic, uh, the genetics of that activity, you know, making sure that you're not, um, that you're not taking, not taking from one stock and maybe contaminating another stock or uh, just keeping that genetic uh, diversity in mind. No. Yeah, just just to follow up on that, and uh, and and from an ethical standpoint, I don't think it's a problem. Uh, but Dave mentioned the genetics, and so the federal government, and again, uh, in 2012, when Atlantic sturgeon were listed, it was it, the species is listed, but there are five different groupings of that species. So the Connecticut River, the Delaware River, the Hudson River were combined into what's called the New York Bite Distinct Population Segment. And the Delaware River has its own genetic, genetic lineage. And so the federal government, the, the federal scientists, there's no appetite on their end to start a reintroduction program until it's the very, till the, you know, till the, the, it's, the, it's the solution of last resort. And part of that reason is, is because otherwise, if you just start a hatchery program and you're putting animals out there, What's the goal of it if you haven't done anything about the sources of mortality? And so you're just putting more fish out there to end up on the beach and then we get phone calls. <laughs> My dog is really good at finding dead sturgeon, so I don't even take her anymore. I just wanted to add one, which Dwayne made me think about. When, when, you, do, um, uh, when you do think about reintroduction of endangered species or animals into the uh, to kind of restore a population, you have to think about the things that we talked about earlier tonight, um, and have they been addressed? You know, the, the reasons for the the reason the animal was extirpated or is no longer there that stressor has that been addressed? And if it has, well, then you can start to go down a different path. So there's still a lot of stressors or factors at play for sturgeon that are that need to be addressed as well as other endangered species before yeah. you reintroduce them. Because otherwise you're just sending them out there to die. Yeah, fail, okay. 
One of the questions we got really quick, Dwayne, there was a question about, are there signs where people are being asked to report dead sturgeons or how do people report when they see a dead sturgeon? Yeah, so there's there's actually a, a national reporting network now. Um, I think it's called, if, if you Google Scoot, and we can, we can so S-C-U-T-E, uh, and so the National Marine Fishery Service, which is the federal agency that is, there's a national reporting network for these, you know, and, and, and their primary interest is in, is in coastal species, both East Coast, West Coast, and Gulf. But they also, I think they handle other reports. So there is a national reporting system. And then the, the, our region, uh, Delaware, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania have a network, a response network that uh, when an animal is called in, various, you know, the, the, the phone chain start. I know that probably everybody has received those calls over the years. Yeah. And there was a question which I can't which I can't find right now, but it was a good question, which is like if there was a way to repopulate, to bring sturgeon back and some of the fish you are studying, what is kind of like the baseline that we want to return to? Where do we want to be? You know, how do we set that number of like this would be great if we came back to this number? I, I don't know if I will talk about numbers. I think part of the uh, research that we do trying to understand the evolution and how they are related to each other is giving us clues into maybe what species do we need to return. Into, like when you have, if you think about like a genealogy or like a tree of life, you're thinking about a species that maybe are um, unique in one environment or related to something that is like very diverse. And so that that's giving you clues of like, maybe you need to protect that, that species that is unique because there is no other similar to mm -hmm. that. So it's, to me, it's more than numbers. It's just what species uh, are, are more likely to survive and guarantee the, the lineage type thing. Mm -hmm. And that, um, but that will be from a from a different kind of angle that I'm, I'm looking at it. I, I don't work with numbers in, in terms of like what to put back and stuff. I'll just comment. So Eric mentioned earlier that uh, these animals are, are blessed with a curse and that they're really good to eat. And, um, you know, this is an economic source. So my when we think when I think about recovery from a fishery standpoint, I mean, from an ecological standpoint, it's great. When I think about recovery, I see this as a resource. And, you know, ultimately, it would be wonderful if 100, 200 years down the road, we had a sustainable fishery. I think that would be great if we had a source of wild domestic caviar. Mm -hmm. Is that ever going to happen? I, probably not in my lifetime, but, but I, I think it would be a wonderful goal. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's one of the things from a fisheries management perspective, when the, the agencies get together and they start talking about what recovery goals are, one of those is a sustainable fishery. So people had a lot of very specific questions about solutions. So maybe I'll just try to run through them quickly. Are there efforts in place to reduce vessel strikes or boat strikes currently that you're aware of? I'm trying to think how to phrase this. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. What about... Not, not that I'm aware of. Okay, what about sediment? We talked a lot about sediment and the role it plays. Is there anything happening that would reduce that impact? Absolutely. Yeah, there's actually okay. a lot a lot that goes on to try and remove sediment or deal with sediment pollution. Um, and uh, that's part of like a, a regulatory framework that most of your uh, state agencies have where they, uh, once they've determined what the, the reason for the stream being impaired, um, they come up with a, what they call a TMDL, which basically is like a target for reducing. If that impairment is due to sediment, they have a TMDL for it, which I total, total maximum daily load. And uh, so that's just how much sediment is allowed. And it's a target basically to kind of get that down to uh, what they think is a suitable, suitable level. So there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, sometimes you s small things. Um, I think, I think the kind of siltation that I was thinking of earlier is like really big landscape changes. So as we have our farms, we can maybe improve farming practices. Uh, one popular thing is riparian zones. This is the border along a stream. 
uh, not farming all the way to the edge of the border, uh, edge of the stream, but placing a buffer of vegetation and grasslands or uh, forests in there, that helps filter out sediment uh, so it doesn't make it into the stream. So there's a lot of best management practices out there. Would that be green infrastructure? What you just mentioned, would that fall under that? Like somebody mentioned, for example, a muscle wall that was built here in Fairmount to, to kind of, you know, where we put something in place that is meant to help how things flow and go. Any other efforts like that in place? Uh, you know, I'm not 100% sure where the green infrastructure versus sedimentation, I, yeah, I would say it falls under that. Mm -hmm. uh, I hear green infrastructure tends to get, uh, I would say yes. The short answer is yes. A lot of times it gets lumped in with storm water though when I think yeah, of green and, and one of the things, another term that you'll see is, is living shorelines. Um, instead of, and, and there's a group at, at VIMS that is, is working on and, and looking at the, the how different strategies of, of planting uh, different uh, marsh grasses and, and basically making it a, a natural shoreline instead of a hardened shoreline. So a bulkhead or other aspects that are more prone to collapse and, and washing that sediment into riverine systems. Um, you'll, and I, I would think that that would be green. Yeah. <laughs> green. I guess that was being in Philadelphia so much. I hear a lot of green infrastructure and it's always, it's always focused on storm water here. Mm -hmm. So that's why yeah. I kind of went to that. Another question we got is, how is the endangered status helping sturgeon? Or is it, I guess, is perhaps the question. I, I'm, I'm going to say that just in general, the Endangered Species Act was created as a framework to try to protect a, a number of species, not just the sturgeon. And what yeah. it's trying to do is to to regulate what's done with the species. And, and so in, in uh, expecting that it, this is gonna affect the likelihood of survival. And specific with the sturgeon? So um, I was actually here in the academy is the, the holotype of the short-nosed sturgeon, which is the first short-nosed sturgeon that was ever described to, to describe the species. So we're really fortunate here. We've spoken about Atlantic sturgeon, but the short-nosed sturgeon is kind of the, it's the one that no one really talks about because it doesn't get much over four or five feet long. But short-nosed sturgeon were listed in 1967 in the, for the precursor of the Endangered Species Act, which was enacted in 1972. I mentioned that because short-nosed sturgeon, if you look at the Endangered Species Act, short-nosed sturgeon are the very first species, fish species that's listed. It's taxonomic, but hey, it's something, it's, it's there. So short-nosed sturgeon in the Delaware River, we took the fishery pressure off, we improved water quality. Short-nosed sturgeon are doing great. There's, I mean, population estimates of short-nosed are in the tens of thousands. We don't talk about those. We probably should talk about those more. But with Atlantic sturgeon, the listing in 2012 really forced some people. Some of you may have seen the recent EPA decision that I think it's open for public comment until Monday about raising water quality standards in the Delaware River. That's a direct result of the Endangered Species Act listing. Raising those water quality standards and improving sewage treatment in the Philadelphia metropolitan area is gonna have great impact on all these species, striped bass, shad, river herring. So that the reason that happened was because of the Endangered Species Act listing. No one would have done, I mean, they would have never gotten the leverage to do that. So I think it's done great things. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add to that, like the Endangered Species Act like includes like, I don't know, like 1500 species and it's not just like fish, you know, like there's a lot of other like crustacean uh, mammals like that get included there just to, to create that like line of protection to guarantee that there is a, a survival So Yeah, and it, it does create that, that recognition of and, and that regulatory framework to that is necessary to to focus on what is the critical habitat. You know that's part of the the listing process. Is once it's become listed, um, jurisdictions are are you know they have to to follow federal law, define these uh, critical habitat stretches, and and that is an important 
you know, step in habitat management. Another question we had gotten was about the enforcement of different rules, especially when it comes to pollution. So are we spending enough resources monitoring water quality, making sure that everybody is sticking to the rules as they are right now? Will you get caught if you are doing something bad in the river, so to speak? <laughs> I, I don't have, uh, I think we need a policy person up here. Uh, I don't really have a great answer for that. I would say that uh, I think some of the bigger, um, some of the framework that, um, let's see, was passed around the same time with the Clean Water Act and then the uh, National Environmental Policy Act and so forth, um, you know, kind of creates a framework where you have a group, you have an organization, a, a commission, uh, the, like the Delaware River Basin Commission, that has to um, regulate discharges, and you need a, a permit to discharge to the Delaware. And so, um, do people get away with it? Uh, that I, I wouldn't know. You'd have to ask those folks that are are busy kind of tracking those things. But they're definitely um, they're definitely uh, monitoring it and kind of pushing for the things that that Dwayne just talked about, or, or involved in the discussions about improving water quality and dissolved oxygen and wastewater treatment and so forth in the region. All right. I think it's almost time to wrap up. So I was wondering if in closing, each of you could think about what your hope is going forward. What is sort of the thing that you are most passionate about making it happen? And what is your hope for the next decade or so? Should we start with you since we started this way before? Sure. Sure. I was just uh, trying to think about I think the idea of today was a little bit of uh, creating that like awareness about what's going on, not just with the sturgeon, but with other species. But I think a lot of people, like if you were here, you you care about this kind of issues. And so you, you know that this is happening and that our actions to a certain uh, degree affect this environment and uh, because of that, the species as well. So I think that little actions can make big changes in in that sense and uh just things like uh i i personally and that's like a personal choice i don't eat any animals or anything like that so that's that's one way to do it but even like it just being aware of what your consumption is and how that affects the environment where we live not just in terms of like food but uh just try like recycle reuse all of those things that they they tell us all the time i think they are very important and so I think that's one one thing that I um, that we wanted to get across today, and the fact that we have I, I, a lot of you might be familiar with all what we have behind the scenes, but just like to to kind of like communicate again that we have this active research behind the scenes that is trying to get these snapshots of what's in the uh, nature and has been around for so long that is an open resource for us to understand how nature has changed and to make predict predictions of what's coming. So, um, so I, I would, you know, echo a lot of what Mary Angela said, um, but as well as, um, you know, to extend it to put, what I hope people get out of this is putting themselves into the context of, of the world. You know, you're, you're part of this uh, ecosystem. You, your impacts, you know, your, your lives, other, your 10 degrees separated, you know, all affect what's going on in different habitats, in the water. And, and that is a, a, a pretty remarkable thing to think about. And, and thinking about your, um, you know, how much that varies across the, the range of, you know, sturgeon from Georgia to Labrador, you know, that's a big stretch of, of area. And to know that you're in witnessing and, and within the reach of these really remarkable organisms, and that's pretty cool. And, and but also to recognize that things are changing, that, you know, ranges are shifting you know, fish are, are moving in and out of existence. And, and 
you know, that's, that's an important factor. And on the other side of my life, you know, things change in, in you know, a hundred years, but in 70 million years, you know, in, on, you know, at all these different scales. And it, it's a pretty remarkable thing to think about these, these animals as, as the descendants of those uh, species that were alive at that time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I guess a few things I'd like to just uh, get across is, you know, I'm very, I'm very optimistic for the future. Um, I think uh, for the first 20 years of my career, I've spent a lot of time describing and understanding and understanding how things work and what's broken or, or what's the, what might be the cause for some of the things we talked about tonight. Um, I'm very optimistic with all the new tools that I, I keep seeing come onto the scene like environmental genomics and we didn't like genetic tools like CRISPR and, and things that are out there that um, there's just a lot of tools and technologies that I think can help us solve some of these problems. And I really want to get to a point um, where you take all that uh, work that was done describing and understanding the distribution of animals and what's causing problems and getting more towards um, restoring, possibly restoring some of these uh, endangered fishes, and um, you know that's what I hope for in the next in the next ten years. Bringing them back, <laughs> Bring, bringing them back, fixing some of the wrongs. Yep. Mm -hmm. So my number one goal is to make science cool again, and I'm not doing a very good job. But, but I say that from an educational standpoint. It's right? always been cool. <laughs> no, but science shouldn't be a four letter word, right? It it shouldn't be. But I I I think, and, and to to follow up on some of the things that have been mentioned earlier, I really think it's to me, one of the things that I want to see, and the only way, as a scientist, I do science, I report those, those findings to management, and then managers and policymakers get together with regulators, and they, they create the framework. But we need stakeholder engagement. We can't, we can't do it alone. We don't have the resources. And, you know, it's, it's, as Eric pointed out, this is a creature that's been around for 70 million years. And to think that you know, it could go away in 125 years because of what we've done just isn't right. And so, you know, my goal in 10 years is to leave things in a better place than when I got it. And and that's what I really want to do. And I think, I, again, I can't thank you all enough and for the people that made tonight happen because we need, this is what we need in, in, a, in, a, in a great context like this to have these discussions and uh, wonderful questions. So thank you. And thank all of you for the great questions. I really appreciate this. <laughs> and now we're gonna turn things back over to Marina. Uh, I would like to thank some folks who've been working hard behind the scenes to make this program happy, uh, happen, including Molly Gross, our public program director. And we have Frank Galavis in the booth and John Huddlemeyer. I wanna thank Liam and Millie for the great um, note passing and, and for you, to all of you for your incredible questions. Um, we, are, we feel very fortunate to be joined by uh, these remarkable scientists. And um, of course, we, we deeply respect the scientists on our staff. Um, Mike, and thank you so much. And I do believe that um, you know, public conversations like this are vital. And I am excited too on the kind of um, path the Academy's going towards working towards regenerative uh, restore, you know, restoration work in the community. So the Patrick Center is um, a, very active in that. And so look for conversations around that in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Mike. And, and if I could add one, one quick yeah. thing, we have a reporter here tonight, Zoe Reed from WHOI's Climate Desk. And she talked to some of the panelists beforehand and she will summarize this discussion. So please, do look to whyy.org for our Climate Desk news coverage, not just of this event, but of, of many things, especially pertaining to the Delaware watershed. So thank you all again for coming, and we'll see you again soon, right? Yep. Um, June 13th, Mike and we'll be back um, mm -hmm. with an author who has written a book called Timefulness, uh, looking at geologic time. So uh, we hope to see you back then. So thanks again for being thank such a great you. audience.